It's funny thinking back to a couple years ago when the survival horror genre was almost completely absent from AAA gaming. Living in the year 2022 and having phenomenal AAA games like RE7, RE2 Remake, Dead Space is coming back to life, we have a plethora of great indie titles like Tormented Souls, Elisa, and basically everything Puppet Combo makes, survival horror fans have been spoiled as of late. Around 2010 with the release of the incredible indie horror game Amnesia The Dark Descent, the entire games industry took notice as to what this almost out of nowhere smash hit was doing with its, dare I say, innovative gameplay. Amnesia is a horror game where players have to survive against monsters while solving puzzles. The catch is you can't fight back against whatever's pursuing you. Running and hiding is the goal to the game's combat. I really like the first Amnesia. The dark mood, oppressive atmosphere, castle setting, basic gameplay concept, all of it felt so refreshing at the time. But this might sound funny with my praise of the title, I'm not the biggest fan of the type of game it's trying to be. It's a genre I like to call hide-and-seek horror. Games like Outlast, Slender, and Five Nights at Freddy's, just to name a few. For a time, every horror game wanted to be amnesia, and it kinda sucked. The survival horror genre is an offshoot of the action-adventure genre. Combat, resource management, using your head to solve puzzles and make it past enemies, those are the pillars of survival horror. It's the surviving at any cost that makes the genre special, whether that be fighting back or running. That's why titles like Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Dead Space, Condemned, Fatal Frame, and so many others connect with players. For so long in the 2010s, horror games were desperate to remove combat from the gameplay formula, which in my opinion was very lame. My favorite parts of survival horror games are the moments where I feel helpless and I don't know what to do. There might be an enemy around the corner that I can fight or run away from, or there might be a calming save room just behind that lonely ominous door. Not knowing what to do on your first playthrough, but making it through regardless is a very powerful feeling. I feel even more powerful on my second playthrough with all of the proper knowledge of the game. I have the ability to totally wreck everything that was destroying me before. Almost every classic survival horror game, and even newer ones like the aforementioned Dead Space and Condemned, have this satisfying replayability baked into their core design. With hide-and-seek horror games, that kind of replayability and experimentation is not really anywhere to be found. With Resident Evil, the game that birthed survival horror, going in the hyper-action direction, as well as franchises like Silent Hill and Dead Space with its third entry to be specific, things were looking a bit dark for my favorite genre. That was when the man, the myth, the legend, Shinji Mikami decided that, hey, I'm not really liking all of these action games and hide-and-seek simulators posing as survival horror. After completing a few freelance gigs like Vanquish and Shadows of the Damned, Mikami and 12 other game devs, including ex-members of Capcom and Platinum Games formed Tango Gameworks right out of Osaka. Armed with this new studio and a lot of ambition, Mikami started working on his next title, a game that would strive to bring back true classic survival horror gameplay, The Evil Within, or as it's known in Japan, Psycho Break. Starting its life as Project Zvai, the mission statement of this game would be simple, bring classic survival horror challenge, mechanics, and atmosphere back to the mainstream. In late 2010, Mikami drafted up the earliest design docs for this title's world, story, and gameplay. You'd play as Sebastian Castellanos, a very normal detective investigating a mass murder at a mental hospital, trapped in an ever-changing supernatural environment. Sebastian would struggle to survive against hordes of psychotic monsters while also solving puzzles and pieces together a very dark mystery. One of the main goals with this title's gameplay was to make players feel at a disadvantage at all times. Environments would more often than not be cramped. Sebastian, while being able to defend himself, wouldn't be able to pull off stylish tricks like previous Resident Evil protagonists, and resources like healing and ammo would be intentionally very scarce. Announced in 2013 with a breathtaking live-action trailer evoking the vibe of classic J-horror, The Evil Within would finally see the light of day, and I was very excited. At its announcement, the hype cycle around this title was insane. I remember seeing so many behind-the-scenes videos leading up to the game's release that shed maybe a little too much light on what this dark mystery had lying in wait. I remember watching a few trailers, but ultimately staying as far away from this game as possible until I had it in my possession. One thing that always stuck out to me was this clip from an interview held by X-Play's Adam Sessler where he sat down with Mikami and lead conceptual artist Ikumi Nakamura to discuss the game's various creatures. 
a lot of the other enemies as existing physical objects, but this one tends to manifest itself. <笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> This moment, in particular, kinda lives in my head, rent-free. Ikumi's brutal honesty here is actually quite the Mikami move. If you know anything about Shinji Mikami's career, you'd know that he's got a very no-nonsense attitude when it comes to developing games. Ikumi, being his protege at the time, clearly rubbed off on this talented artist. In retrospect, a project lead openly dunking on the game she was currently working on probably wasn't the best sign. Red flag aside, I was still pretty hyped. How foolish I was. Oh, guys, I I'm just kidding. Or am I? Well, why don't we actually talk about the evil within? As always, I have a lot to say. So without further ado, let's see if Mikami and Tango Gameworks were able to pull off the true classic survival horror revival. Let's dive in. Evil Within begins with our main cast of characters, the Crimson City police officers, Sebastian Castellanos, Joseph Oda, and newcomer, Julie Kidman, on their way to investigate a mass murder at Beacon Mental Hospital. Upon arriving at the building, something seems off. The trio come across a handful of abandoned police wagons, lots of yellow tape, and no signs of life. Stepping inside the building, we're met with a grisly scene. It's utter chaos. All but one person is alive, and this guy doesn't look like he's in good shape. Checking the nearby security system, we see something quite peculiar play out. After getting knocked out by a ghostly apparition, Sebastian awakens in a slaughterhouse. Cutting himself free, we're introduced to this game's stealth mechanics. The door to safety is shut, locked tight. Sneaking around the butcher that strung you up and grabbing his key unlocks the door. But right before we're able to make our escape... Uh-oh. It just had to be a chainsaw man, didn't it, Mikami? Yeah, that's gonna get infected. Whoa, bro. <laughs> this place is wild. Stumbling through hell itself, Sebastian finds an escape that leads to quite the psychotic slip and slide. Yeah, that's infected. After his death-defying escape, Sebastian finds himself under the hospital itself. Here, we have to carefully sneak by this chainsaw-wielding freak once again, which is horrifyingly intense. Getting dangerously close to this guy and using anything we can throw, we distract the big lug, creating a path to our exit. We eventually find an elevator, but the chainsaw man's back. As Sebastian slowly makes his way over the myriad of objects blocking his path, he safely makes it to the lift. Damn, that was insane. As the lift makes its way to the surface, we end up in that murder hallway we saw earlier on the security monitor. Great. The building begins to shake as an earthquake hits. Sebastian makes his way outside, where we see the city literally falling apart. Oh my god. We find Sebastian's fellow officers in an ambulance, and altogether everyone leaves. What follows is one of the most stylishly shot and choreographed city disasters I've ever seen. I 
love how quickly this game establishes an air of inescapable horror. This isn't just a zombie outbreak, this is something a lot more evil. Sebastian and friends are accompanied by another survivor, a young boy named Leslie. Sebastian sees the ghostly man from the hospital, their driver begins zombifying, and Leslie basically speaks into being our crew falling off a cliff. Thus beginning... The Evil Within. Now that was one hell of a way to start a game. For how cool and over the top it is, and how much I was genuinely intrigued by it, the rest of this title, for me personally, sadly, doesn't hold up to its intro's hype. I'm sure you've noticed the title of this video by now, and can probably gather I'm not the biggest fan of Evil Within. Well, it's more complicated than that, so let's dig a bit deeper. Evil Within calls itself a survival horror game. For most of its runtime, it wants to be a survival horror game. Sometimes it actually is survival horror, but that's not exactly what you're getting out of the overall package that is is Evil Within. At its core, this game has a lot of survival horror elements like limited resources such as ammo and heals, lots of encounters that can be bypassed via stealth takedowns or running away, and there are save rooms dotted throughout the game's levels. The problems that arise from sitting down with this title's gameplay loop for hours on end is that you realize that it's all quite linear and rather unpolished. The cracks quickly begin to show. Character movement is sluggish, stilted even. The act of turning in most cases can feel awkward if you're in combat or just a narrow space. It's not like a I'm just learning how to use tank controls type of awkward, but an input delay type of awkward. Like you'd expect, enemies hit hard and will often rush you, which can be quite the hassle with that unpolished control feel. Firing your gun is its own challenge. Holding the aim button down zooms the camera all the way in until all you can see is Sebastian's hand holding his gun. It's basically almost first person view. You might think this is good, right? The camera is focusing on what's right in front of you, but out of the gate, each and every single firearm's crosshair is erratic. Moving and shooting is possible, but that'll throw Sebastian's aim off severely. Aiming might be a little too inaccurate at the start. By the way, there's also an upgrade system. Much like RE4, after defeating certain enemies, they'll drop different amounts of green gel. Collecting this stuff is what upgrades the way too many stats available to you. These upgrades play into mostly everything that make up your character and equipment. Of course, accuracy for each firearm is something you can upgrade, which isn't all that fun and feels like a waste most of the time. You can also freely aim and fire your guns by pressing the right trigger, like most video games, but even this can be challenging. What do you think of when you hear me say the words, free aim shooting? Do you think of games like Gears of War, where the act of pulling the trigger centers Marcus on whatever the camera is pointed at, firing away without a care in the world? In Evil Within, pulling the trigger raises Sebastian's arm, and pulling the trigger again fires the gun. If you want to quickly shoot something behind you, maybe even while you're running, the arm raise input has to happen, then a new animation of Sebastian jankily spinning around has to play out before he can fire again. It's pretty bad. If I can barely hit anything while using the actual aiming function? What makes you think I'll use this busted free aim? Even Operation Raccoon City lets you free aim and fire, and it's very accurate, but everyone hates on that game. Guess it wasn't a true return to survival horror. By the way, I was looking through Evil Within's art book and found this interesting render of a naked Kidman. None of the other characters have a render like this in the book. I just thought I'd bring that up. No particular reason. I've got a rant about the upgrade system a little more, so please forgive me. This game barely gives you any ammo, and I know what you're thinking, survival horror. It's a little more peculiar than that. At the start, you can only hold a certain amount of ammo on backup. You'll have to upgrade each weapon's ammo reserves, which is kind of insane. You're basically upgrading the depth of Sebastian's individual pockets. Multiple times in the early game, you will have to pass up ammo lying around because you can't pick it up. The game doesn't have an actual inventory system like Resident Evil, where you can bank piles of ammo and items, instead opting for a weapon wheel. So the solution to the non-issue that is potentially having too much ammo at the start is forcing the player to waste their upgrade currency on increasing their ability to carry a valuable resource that helps them get through the game. Instead of rewarding a player with loads of ammo for playing smart, tackling situations in stealth, or running away from their enemies conserving their ammo, you know, <laughs> using your survival horror instincts, you make them not have the ability to carry as much ammo as they can find because they're already carrying too much, which is usually too little. Games like classic Resident Evil and Silent Hill let you carry whatever amount of a specific ammo type you can find. The balance in those titles came in the amount of damage enemies took. So if you had like 50 to 100 pistol bullets saved up, all of that could end up being spent on just a few basic enemies, encouraging you to get around them and run away. The way this game handles the player not having a ton of ammo is that a lot of the time you're forced into 
combat situations where defeated enemies will drop ammo. This game's take on ammo distribution and conservation feels so artificial. No matter how dire the situation, I always seem to have ammo, even when I was expending ungodly amounts of it. I think once you cross that line into enemies giving you the means and defeating them, you're an action game. You're Halo, you're Max Payne, you're RE4. Going for Sebastian's core body stats is punishing early on. It's like you're choosing the game's difficulty based on what you're specking in. This is stuff you think about in an action RPG, not a survival horror game. I need to stop going on about this, literally no one cares except for me. No, you know what? When you max out all of your ammo stocks, the game gives you an achievement called Why Can't I Hold All This Ammo? Yeah, why can't I? Uncle Shinji, I thought I was a good niece. All I ever do is talk about how cool your games are. Why you gotta do me like this? When low on ammo, Sebastian can melee attack straight up punching or gun butting enemies. Odd when he has a sharp knife in his possession, but I guess that's only reserved for stealth kills. Like everything else in this game, melee attacks can be boosted with upgrades. The issue here is that they always suck, even at the max level. Don't even waste your brain juice upgrading this stuff. You'd think if ammo was in limited supply, upgrading one of your infinite offensive options to fall back on would balance out the lack of ammo, but it's not that tangible, surprisingly. This just in, after testing out the maxed out melee attack, I did find that it does make enemies take a knee after a while, opening them up for a special match kill, but I still stand by upgrading other things, because even then, it isn't that useful in combat. The most egregious thing about the upgrade system, I know, I'm sorry, I'm just ranting about upgrades now, but please bear with me. Look, I get upgrading the gun's reload speed, damage output, ammo capacity, firing rate, and even things like your personal health, but why the hell is Sebastian's sprint three seconds long by default? It goes by so fast. Why do I have to upgrade this ability to eventually run for only 10 seconds? It's kind of bullshit. It also takes a second to recharge, and Sebastian waddles around clutching his stomach like he just completed a triathlon. Like I mentioned before, upgrading a body stat like this felt punishing more often than not. In Evil Within, you're rewarded for doing combat rather than trying to get away from your enemies. You know, Harry and Heather Mason being normal-ass human beings can sprint for a limited amount of time, but also run a healthy speed forever. Sebastian has police training. Why can't he run for more than a few feet before needing a nap? What, too many donuts? Speaking of waddling around, I really don't like how, I don't know, bouncy Sebastian's movement animations are sometimes. Certain movements play out in absurd fashion. Look at this Looney Tunes stair climbing animation. I walked through most of my recent playthroughs, so I didn't have to see these goofy animations play out. It probably added at least an hour of time to my completion score, but the genuine vibes and atmosphere definitely made up for it. Sebastian's got too much pep in his step, he's gotta relax. There are multiple progression roadblocks that have to be bypassed by completing puzzles, a classic staple for these types of games, but every riddle you come by is brain dead easy. I'm glad puzzles are in this game, but most of the challenge comes in the game's combat scenarios. To give the gameplay credit, there are a lot of fun weapons to be found. Once you upgrade their accuracy and firepower, taking out hordes of haunted is pretty great. Sebastian's arsenal is your standard survival horror fare, plus a few unique exceptions. Pistols, shotguns, and a sniper rifle help you get through most of the game and feel great with satisfying headshots and dismemberment. Single-use items like axes and torches help deal heavy damage to individual targets. Sebastian can also use his matches to burn downed enemies, kind of like RE1 Remake, but this time you're not doing it to prevent them from coming back to life. Matches are more of an opportunity to burn groups of enemies. If you down a monster and then strategically light them up with other enemies close by, they'll all go up in a blaze of glory, and it's awesome. The standout weapon is the Agony Crossbow, which is as metal as it sounds. This thing reminded me of the classic Resident Evil grenade launcher. This bow is multifaceted with its own craftable ammo. Picking up scrap metal and disarming traps allows you to craft one of five ammo types, spears, explosive rounds, and specialty rounds like shock and freeze bolts. There's some good experimentation to be had with all of those options, and each bolt acts differently at its max level. The spears, for example, will burn at level 5, so if you're fighting a monster weak to flame, you'll have a much easier time dealing with them while also saving on your other ammo types. If you download the Fighting Chance DLC pack, you get two additional bolt types, the poison round, which is a one-shot kill against a single target, and flame rounds, 
Both of these feel like pay to win options, but I would have liked to see them included as unlockables. The crossbow can get pretty busted with its flash rounds. They're basically stun grenades. The catch is, the flash opens up monsters to a free stealth kill. So fire one of these rounds into a crowd of zombies and have fun going combo mad, killing everything with little effort. Some might call this easy mode, but when enemies hit as hard as Evil Within's, you'll be looking for the fastest ways to take these goons down. With that in mind, one of the best things about this title is its enemy variety. Each chapter throws new threats your way. There's a lot to take in and adapt to on the fly. The starting zombies are Ganado-like, using melee attacks and grabs. These demons will upgrade their armaments, eventually getting melee weapons and guns, which creates some very interesting challenges. There are special invisible enemies that you have to find by looking at certain things in the environment, like puddles and objects they interact with. I thought that was such a cool way to use the visual tech and props in a gameplay assisting way. There are a lot of cool gimmicky monsters like this, but there are just way too many of them to talk about. A problem I have with this game is the unhealthy amount of things that can kill you in one shot. Some of the enemies and bosses suffer from this kind of design, often feeling unfair, but most of it comes from the game's levels playing pranks on you. Imagine getting to a new area and what seems like a basic enemy shows up. Okay, time to run. Oh no, it one-shotted me with a ground attack. Guys, Sebastian got one-shotted by nothing. Oh, there he is. As you'd imagine, stuff like this can get fairly tedious after a while, especially in certain parts of the game where you're just trying to explore, but some dumbass sneaks up on you and blows your head clean off. More on that later. Doing combat against these guys can be a lot of fun, just not when that fun is interrupted by something saying, no, you stood too close to me. Time to die. And that happens more than you want on your first playthrough. One-shot enemies can be done well, but the sheer amount of things in this game that can kill you before you even know what's going on comes off very lame and tiresome. Some of the bosses suffer from one-shot-itis, but thankfully most of them are pretty great. Lara, the spider lady featured heavily in the game's marketing, will kill you in one hit if you get too close, which I guess is the point because some of her encounters are just runaway set pieces. Kind of uninspired. The Keeper, the iconic safe head, is my favorite. Its first boss fight sees Sebastian locked in a dungeon while a gas leak is in effect. You've got to seal off the leak while dealing with this thing's pursuit. The cool part is the boss arena is littered with extra safes. If you kill the Keeper, it immediately comes back to life using one of these demonic storage devices. The battle is half combat scenario, half run away, with a little bit of puzzle solving thrown in for good measure. Basically representing most of the things you do in this game, it's almost like a vertical slice in boss form. The Keeper shows up a couple more times in slightly different scenarios, and one of them is even optional if you stay quiet. Very cool stuff. Like the basic enemy variety, there are so many bosses in this game, some more memorable than others, like the squid I always forget about but then kill in like two seconds. One of my favorites is Amalgam, the crazy ball of human bodies that stalks you in an underground car park. Gotta say, playing on the fear of getting jumped in a car park is probably the realest form of terror this game goes for. It's such a visually amazing boss fight as well. The lighting in this area looks downright photoreal at times. You can also take this thing down in a few different ways, blinding its main eye with flash bolts, sneaking around, using the horrible red barrels to deal splash damage, or just going to town on it with your magnum. I'm glad most of the bosses give you multiple ways in taking them down. It adds some replayability, keeping the individual fights fresh. One of my biggest issues I have with this game is its strict chapter-based levels. These linear chapters barely feature any backtracking, memorable puzzles, or key hunts. Unless the chapter you're in is an open-ended environment in itself, which happen to be few and far between, you're pretty much getting basic straight-shot goals that often lead to open and closed action set pieces. That doesn't mean you're just shooting your way through everything, because of course, the game barely gives you any ammo. I'm so salty about that, I'm sorry. The real reason is that the game usually wants you to fight enemies. Evil Within kinda tricks you in the beginning. One of the opening chapters takes place in a very RE4-centric village. There are lots of houses you can explore with plenty of items to be found and tons of enemies roaming around. The goal is to get the village's front gate open, but how do you do that exactly? Well, you've gotta kill the sadist, the chainsaw maniac, and use his saw to cut the gate's chain. The whole chapter is basically a scavenger hunt leading up to this boss fight. You're sneaking around enemies, 
stealth killing them, finding ammo, heals, and even weapons, and finally taking on the big boss. This part is so great, it's slow paced, genuinely tense, and you're in full control of your actions. The way these basic enemy encounters play out before the big chainsaw battle is up to you and your skill. It feels very survival horror. It made me think this was gonna be the rest of the game, but right after this chapter, the following levels quickly railroad you into some obnoxious linear set pieces. Oh, now I'm suddenly in a slaughterhouse where I have to kill a horde of enemies for a door to open. Is this Devil May Cry? Uh-oh, Kidman's drowning in a glass tank. Gotta kill like four waves of enemies that are all dropping ammo for my guns. Drats, looks like I'm in a medieval ruin and have to snipe ballista soldiers while also dodging Los Illuminados rejects. Oh, look who's back. Evil Within has way more in common with RE4 than it does with a game like RE1. I'm not saying trying to be like RE4 is bad, it's just not survival horror. I love RE4, it's one of the most well-polished, well-playing, replayable fun games ever made. Evil Within is not. RE4 took like two to three game mechanics and hyper-polished them. Evil Within has so many things going on from running, sneaking, vaulting, shooting, melee, stealth kills, puzzles, and it hasn't polished any of it. Understand that I'm not saying the game is just a run and gun, janky action fest. There is a lot of that, but there are also plenty of moments of quiet time where you're exploring beautiful locations and finding items. These moments where you get to unwind a bit, checking drawers, cabinets, smashing open wooden crates, looking for resources, are some of the best parts. The moments of downtime are found in the open-ended levels, but like we discussed, there aren't a whole lot of those. The ratio of action set pieces is much higher to the moments where you're just vibing out. It's not all bad, however. I find a lot of the levels genuinely entertaining despite how insane they are from a survival horror perspective. The Carnival of Death is one of my favorites, especially with its giant spinning blade hovering right over Sebastian while enemies are attacking him. It's like, oh no, he's gonna get me. What do I do? Oh, whatever, I got this. Oh, while we're on this particular subject, let me tell you about a level that royally disappointed me. There is a full Resident Evil Spencer Mansion callback in Evil Within, the Victoriano Estate. In this drop-dead gorgeous house, you get to slowly explore a beautiful gothic manor, solving gruesome puzzles and piecing together a story about a poor tortured soul slowly becoming a madman. You're witnessing all of this play out while picking through the environment, looking for items and dodging enemies. It's truly amazing. Actually, I lied. The main villain, Ruvik, will randomly show up to one-shot kill you, destroying the mood, forcing you to run back to the save room after solving a puzzle or picking up any key item as to not tediously repeat all of the things you did before you died. It sucks. Like I said at the start, I didn't watch many pre-release trailers, so this wasn't spoiled for me on my first playthrough. When I got here, I thought the game was about to go god mode and give me a true backtrackable survival horror environment. While it kind of does, it's plagued with this outlast tier enemy that forces you to hide under tables as to not be unfairly killed by him. All I wanted to do was look through this house at my own pace. I wanted to walk through it and take in the scenery. Not run through it, barely appreciating the artistry on display while desperately looking for a table to slide under. You got a team of people to basically remake RE1's mansion in at-the-time next-gen graphics that are still great looking by the way, and it's used as a runaround set piece. This game has so many good ideas that are almost always undercut with something totally annoying. Clearly the game has a lot of potential for being something legendary, but it feels like it's afraid to capitalize on said good ideas, this one included, as to not lose that amnesia outlast audience. It's like, come on Mikami, you advertise the game as a return to true survival horror, and you give me this? literally inserting the trend you don't like about contemporary horror games into something that is a love letter to the game that created the genre. There are so many crazy action sequences that come before this that I was hoping this section would take a page out of RE1's book. Making this a slower paced exploration chapter would help break up the constant flow of combat insanity. Instead, we get another high octane set piece. I'm sure the goal with this chapter was to keep the player on edge while exploring, but I don't think one shots and pursuer enemies work that well together. It runs the risk of coming off genuinely annoying more than entertaining. I know it has story significance as well. You're in Ruvik's childhood home, but still, I don't think it should have been this. Let me chill for a minute. Let me do some puzzles. Let me fight a few monsters. The game has enough one-shot enemies. You can build tension with your amazing visuals and sound design. It doesn't have to be a death loop if this guy gets too close to you. Ugh. 
Anyway, the most popular negative talking point against this game is that the late game crumbling Crimson City level feels a little too RE6 in its design. And I don't know if you understand just how true that statement is. In RE6, there's a part where four of the main characters are trapped in locked parallel rooms with these weird sliding disc bombs shuffling between both rooms. Obviously, if they bump into you, they pop, so keeping them at a distance is ideal. This part is also in Evil Within. Like, why would you take this, of all things, from RE6? You know what the worst part about it is? It's not as fun as RE6, because in Evil Within you don't get the satisfaction of screwing over another co-op pair trapped in the same situation. The city really is the cherry on top of the action fest this game desperately wants to be. Non-stop action set pieces, an RE4-style gondola shootout, mounted turret sequence gunning down a horde of zombies, and a ridiculous on-rails spider chase, which by the way has a normal aim camera. When you aim with the left trigger, the camera doesn't zoom in all the way. Why couldn't the whole game look like this? You know that clip I showed you of the guy stun-locking me with explosive arrows? That's not in the city, that's like chapter 4. So when people complain about the city being RE6, I get confused because it's not like the game was lacking in psychotic action up to this point. There's so much crazy bullshit throughout all of this game, before you ever step foot into the city. If you haven't caught on to my endless whinging by now, I don't think Evil Within is a survival horror game. It's an action game. And guess what? That's fine. When you finish the story and start New Game Plus with all of your upgraded gear, the title is way more fun to play in my opinion. Blasting your way through all of the weirdo levels early on feels way more natural to me than trying to jankily sneak around. Going through the earlier levels not passing up ammo felt great too. I don't know, I really hope I'm not coming off like a psycho survival horror elitist with my excruciating gameplay analysis. It's just, at the time, the hype around this game was unreal for me. We were currently in an industry where horror games did not like combat and all wanted to be the same game. All of Evil Within's buzzwords and marketing touting this game as the next best thing since bread came sliced had me expecting something that felt at least like RE2, just with modern graphics and game design. Instead, Evil Within is a less engaging RE4 suffering from an identity crisis. And clearly, I'm still not over that. So as you all know, video games aren't just their gameplay. Stories are important too, the events that drive you forward and make you want to complete the adventure. Well, I didn't really like Evil Within's story as much as I wanted to. I'm very sorry. So one thing I thought was interesting during the title's marketing cycle was Mikami talking about how the story would be told out of order in an unconventional way. As I played through the game back in the day, I did feel like a detective, collecting the key moments of the story, physically writing them in a notebook and piecing the whole thing back together. While I think this is a great idea, it does make for quite the meandering experience most of the time, especially in video game form. Things kinda happen without much context. One moment that always sticks out in my mind is after a pretty big story event and boss fight with the Keeper, Sebastian has to make his way through a small cave system where he's attacked by little action figure sized men. It's super weird and has no relevance to anything. It's just a thing that happens. It's padding. There's a lot of that in this title. The intro of the game being so over the top, essentially teleporting Sebastian to different locations in a heartbeat and generally being cryptic, is the perfect preparation for what you're getting yourself into. Nothing makes sense until it has to. There isn't anything inherently wrong with wanting to tell a non-linear story. Believe me, I'm a massive David Lynch fan. But here in Evil Within, the answers to the questions I had weren't that fulfilling. A big issue that I feel affected my enjoyment of the story is Sebastian being more of an observer rather than a protagonist. Seb kinda fits into the player's avatar archetype. Besides a few cutscenes of him and Joseph bonding over their past adventures, things I don't really have a reason to care about by the way, he's pretty much a blank slate in the main story's content. I didn't feel like there was a whole lot to hang on to with Sebastian. There wasn't much of a relatable connection clearly presented to the player through the story. Sebastian does get characterization through a collection of files, however. However, these files explore Sebastian's backstory before the game's events. We learn about Seb's early days as a beat cop who eventually gets promoted to detective. We learn about one of his partners, a woman named Myra, who he totally falls in love with and ends up marrying. And we also find out about their daughter, Lily, who is tragically killed in a house fire. None of this stuff is ever communicated to the player in cutscenes. It's all restricted to these Sebastian files, which has me thinking the devs finished making most of this game and then realize that Sebastian 
had very little going on. You actually can't miss these files because they're glowing red outside of the save rooms. You can't enter the save room until you pick up the file. Unless you just don't want to go into the save room, you miss out on the story and potentially upgrading your stats. It's bizarre, but that's not where Sebastian's characterization ends, thankfully. We'll talk about this again in a little bit. The real main character, or at least the guy the story wants you to pay the most attention to, is its villain, Ruben Victoriano, aka Ruvik. All of the events that progress the story revolve around Ruvik. Sebastian and his partners don't really have connections to this guy. Besides, oh my god, run! Our trio are just along for the ride watching this sadistic killer's life story play out before them. I actually kinda like the focus on Ruvik because I feel a lot of the time, in general, video game villains tend to get the short end of the stick when it comes to developing their motives. Here, we basically learn everything about Ruvik, his upbringing, how his big sister was killed, his descent into madness, and eventually his work on something called the STEM system. It helps that Ruvik is voiced by Jackie Earl Haley, the guy that played Rorschach in Snyder's Watchmen. His voice and dark performance are golden. Not something I can say about Sebastian or Kidman's actors, sadly. Sebastian is voiced by Anson Mount, who is a fantastic actor but is sorely underutilized here. Jennifer Carpenter plays Kidman, and yeah, the same can be said for her performance. This thing gonna run? Only one way to find out. Shit! What are you doing? Answer me. Please don't get me wrong, I don't think they're bad actors by any means, but I do think whoever voice directed them probably didn't do their job well enough. It sucks that our leads are as flat as Kidman's ass, but at least we have guys like Jackie Earl, Yuri Lowenthal, and Daniel Riordan, voice actors who have been around forever doing their thing. Yuri Lowenthal actually voices Joseph Oda, and he definitely knocks it out of the park. Whenever Joseph and Seb are on screen, Oda carries the material most of the time. Okay, I'm gonna talk about spoilers now, so if you still want to play this game somewhat fresh, skip to the time on screen. The big twist surrounding the supernatural occurrences is that all of the characters you meet throughout the story are connected to a giant machine called a STEM. Everyone is in a Matrix-like brain world, the epicenter being Ruvik's mind, his disembodied brain in the physical world. I think this concept is genuinely cool. It explains why things just happen. All of these different minds crashing into each other with a serial killer's thoughts and memories as the base for it all. The reveal of STEM really enhanced my detective roleplay. I started noticing things in the environment, like Kidman being clearly present on billboards throughout the city, and coming up with my own interpretations for what each monster meant to Ruvik. It was awesome. Iconography and certain doors in the early game look very modern and lab-like, and the mentions of STEM in early game files started making way more sense. I felt like I was figuring this all out. It was fun. With that said, by the end, seeing Sebastian taking out hordes of demons and fighting a massive brain monster in a blood and gore world, flying around on a turret firing away at Ruvik, I just, I just couldn't help but feel empty, you know? Instead of getting excited for this stuff, I just kept thinking about Sebastian's lack of character, all of the unanswered questions I still had, and why I should even care about any of this. Sebastian doesn't have a connection to Ruvik, he's just here, plugged into a machine. He barely talks about what's going on in front of him. This story just didn't pan out in a satisfying way for me. It all just kinda ends, too. Sure, we get a rocket launcher kill. I see all Resident Evil references, and I'm not impressed, by the way. I don't care about references. I don't care about nostalgia. I just wish the game lived up to the hype cycle it was shoving down all of our throats. What starts as an incomprehensible nightmare slowly but surely unravels into a pretty interesting sci-fi horror story that does not pay off. You're unplugged from the dream and walk out the same way you came in. I remember the first time I finished this game back in 2014, I felt a lot like how Sebastian looks in this final cutscene. Spent. Done. I was mentally exhausted by this over-the-top journey. In a lot of ways, Evil Within is like Resident Evil for depressed people. It's nihilistic, it's gross, it's unfair at times, and it never really gets better. And then it ends. And then the Kidman DLC happens. One year after Evil Within's release, we would get a two-part expansion starring the elusive Julie Kidman, The Assignment, and The Consequence. Both of these expansions are like a more content-rich assignment Ada from RE4. Yeah, you basically get to see the main game's story from Kidman's perspective, while also learning a lot about her and her fellow officers. So while Sebastian is running around like a confused goofball, 
Kidman is usually right there beside him. Kidman works for Mobius, the organization that currently houses STEM. She's essentially a spy in the KCPD, looking for candidates for this STEM system. In these DLCs, we get to see not only Kidman's backstory and trauma leading up to the events of Evil Within, but Sebastian's as well. Sebastian's past, his wife's disappearance, and his daughter's death are all communicated to the player through Kidman's story. And it's like, man, I would love to see that happen in the main game. It's just odd how he never thinks about any of his trauma or how Ruvik never uses it against him. Ruvik should have access to everyone's memories in STEM. It's kind of out of character for a vindictive serial killer like this. He uses Kidman's past to halt her progress, so it just comes off weird how blank slady Sebastian is. It's a total missed opportunity. One thing that stood out immediately was how much more polished these DLCs felt compared to the main game. Having an extra year of dev time definitely helped out. Kidman's gameplay borders on hide-and-seek horror, but it reminded me more of a game like Haunting Ground, you know, just without Huey. Most of it is stealth, but you can also defend yourself with a swift kick, pushing back the haunted. Calling out to enemies can lure them to your location, and taking advantage of this is ideal in slipping by. Eventually you'll even find guns, and after hours of having to sneak around, it felt awesome finally taking down these goofy ghouls, bosses included. The pursuer enemy for Kidman is The Shade, a lamp-headed woman who stalks you with a deep, sultry voice. Again, this creature design is fantastic, Ikumi Nakamura is a design genius, what else is there to say? I will say finally killing the shade fell flat for me since Kidman's battle dialogue is still somehow flatter than her ass. I'm not running this time. I really enjoyed the new enemy variety and the overall panic horror vibe to the stealth gameplay. It can't be stated enough that Kidman's story strengthens not only the narrative of Evil Within, but its characters. In just about five hours, these expansions do so much more to humanize Sebastian, Kidman, and Joseph. We get to see Joseph and Seb talking about his wife disappearing and how the death of his child affected everyone in the KCPD. Kidman has her own villain and storyline happening in parallel, and somehow it all works out pretty well together. They're using that idea of things just happening, but since you have the context of what Seb goes through in the main game, all of what Kidman goes through gives further context to those batshit scenarios. Kidman's chapters are great. I think if you're willing to stick out the almost non-existent plot structure of the main game, the Kidman DLCs are a pretty good payoff. But I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to sit out the game's ultimate conclusion, though. It's a lot to ask of anyone, honestly. There's one more DLC called The Executioner. It's not good. It's extremely janky and feels terrible. You play as the Keeper. It's basically an action, arcade, horde mode style kill em all simulator. There's really not that much to talk about with it. If I want to smash shit with a hammer, I'll just go play Halo. Kill. Kill. Evil Within is okay. I don't think it's terrible, but I sure as hell don't think it's the return of survival horror. When I completed this game in 2014, I was left with an immense feeling of emptiness and disappointment. I didn't want to admit the game was bad or janky or whatever negative feelings I had at the time. I told people this game was great even though I didn't believe it myself. I was wrapped up in the Mikami hype cycle, like a lot of people. Whenever I see this game on my shelf, I'm reminded of the good feelings I had leading up to the title's release. That's the first thing I think of, but it's not how I feel about the game we got. A majority of my content revolves around Mikami's work. I honestly love almost all of his games. I think he's a genius when it comes to directing and game design. Evil Within was one of the first times where I started questioning things about my taste in media. Like, am I giving this thing a pass based on games that I loved as a kid? Is this even survival horror? Doesn't feel like it. Does my favorite game director not put out bangers all the time? Am I settling for mediocrity? I was settling. And I've done it multiple times, before and after Evil Within, even on this channel. I'm here to say with confidence that I'm done settling. I'm done settling for half-finished, janky, buggy video games. I'm done. I'm really tired. I hope that I've done a good job at looking at this game with a balanced perspective. There's fun to be had despite its janky nature. I love the audio and visual design of everything in this game. The story gets interesting, but I don't think it pays off without those additional DLCs. And look guys, I need to stress something else that's something that's very important, and I want you to listen carefully. No matter how level-headed you are on the internet, people will get furiously mad at you. So clearly, if you like this game, 
My video doesn't mean I dislike you as a person. This is not a personal attack on you. I had my own sky-high expectations about what it would deliver. And yeah, I don't think it delivered on anything, personally. If you approach Evil Within as a vibe-out game, played in short bursts, you might get more out of it than expecting a grand survival horror epic that makes you feel like a kid again. I hope next time we can get a real survival horror game that focuses on telling a personal story that can get me invested 100% of the time. I guess you'll just have to wait and see. And hey, if you love everything about Evil Within, I'm happy for you. Look, I'm not saying this game is so bad it literally gave me breast cancer. I'm just saying it's like an undercooked steak from Cheesecake Factory. Looks phenomenal, smells good, but it's rubbery in the middle. You gotta chew it for far longer than you want. And when it does go down, you feel like you've got a knot in your stomach. Yeah. That's evil within.